Greetings and welcome, my friends. This is part two of the Kingdom Purposed Marriage series. I hope you have had a chance to look at the first episode. We put it up there somewhere. Please go back and watch the very first one and look at the origins and the purpose that God had when he created marriage. In this second episode, I want to focus on the controversy, the controversy over kingdom purposed marriages. We saw in the last episode how the devil, the wicked one, when he fell from heaven, if you read from the book of Genesis chapter 3, maybe let's read that together, my friends. He came and he had a specific interest. And I want you to look at how he, he weaved his storyline into the storyline of the humankind. Because the Bible says on Genesis chapter 3, the temptation and the fall of men. That's when we see the controversy coming into this planet Earth. Let's look at the scene and pull up some lessons from there, my friends. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Hmm. Very interesting questions, very interesting response. Verse 4 says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the tree and ate and also gave her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God move in the garden and in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Lord God among the trees of the garden." Then the Lord called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then Adam said, The woman you gave me, gave to me, Gave the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust and all the days of your life I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Look at the seed, it's in capital. And shall bruise your head. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise the heel. And it goes on, my friends, and explains God's punishment for the role that men played. So we see here that Marriage, which was created pure, perfect in the Garden of Eden, got a visitor, a third party, that came. The third party had a conversation with one of the two. I'm setting the scene here of how problems begin in our marriages. There's always a third party that comes in. There's always a conversation that's held. There's always a rationalization. Because the Bible says when Eve looked at the proposition from, this, from the serpent, her eyes began to behold things that were not there. And by the way, the Bible does not mean its words that 
the serpent was wiser than all the animals. I believe God had given it supernatural intelligence. I believe God had given it some features that made it a magnificent creature. So the, the Lucifer, the fallen Satan, came through. The most intelligent, the wisest, the most beautiful of God's creation. And used it as a medium. So one point I want to say in this controversy is that Satan does not come by himself. He always uses a medium. I will explain this a little bit more when we get to the third part of how you can save your marriage and how you can deal with third parties that come into your marriage. And so the termination of marriage that then happened later on, maybe let me take a step back. Even in their sinning, when Adam and Eve had fallen, God did not propose divorce to them. Are you listening to me? Even when they had sinned and had fallen short and had sown fig trees around them, God still came to them. God still visited them. God still asked them questions. One of the best strategies for dealing with challenges in your marriage, never state and, and, and declare. Sometimes it's best to ask questions to your spouse. Why did you do this? Who told you this? God asked questions before he could make his judgment. And so God did not even divorce them. But let me tell you, at that moment, the controversy had reached a level where there was division between Adam and Eve. Did you see the response that Adam gave to God when God asked him, where are you? It says, he says, I heard your voice and I heed. Today I want to tell you, there are many people who know their marriages are not right. They know they are living in a sinful relationship. What they are doing is not according to God's voice. What do they do? Exactly what Adam did ran away from the voice of God. Switch off. I don't want to listen to that because it disturbs my condition or it exposes my condition. Friends, if you are blessed to be listening to this presentation and you remember what we talked about in episode two when we explained the six different modes or statuses of our condition in this world, you know if you have been divorced because of sexual immorality, you cannot get married because when you get married, you're practicing sin. You are living in sin again. When you divorce your wife for any other reason besides sexual immorality, the Bible says whoever marries that person or marries that husband causes them to commit adultery. You know exactly where things have fallen apart in your marriage. You know what's not right. But like Adam, many of you run away from God. But please don't run away in this presentation because I'm going to share with you that the problem is not with you. There's an enemy that came in and destroyed things for you and there's a plan that God has to bring you back. So Adam runs away and Eve. But when God finally finds them, he calls them and Adam, Adam, where are you? I don't believe God could not locate them. It was never an issue of location, my friends. God knew because God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He sees everywhere. He sees even the end from the beginning. So he knew where they were. So when God was asking, where are you, Adam? I like the perspective I heard from Pastor Ivan Yatanga that says, God was actually asking, where are you in terms of morality? Where are you in terms of holiness in your marriage? Where are you in terms of love and care and cherishing? Look at the response Adam gives. The woman whom you gave to be with me. There begins gender-based violence. There begins verbal abuse. The woman is now accused of being the one who caused this. Wow. Look at the woman. She doesn't take responsibility either. She says the snake deceived me. But she had a conversation with the snake. And this is a holy eve. She's not sinful by this time. She's, she's holy. Super intelligence in the likeness and image of God. A helper who was meet for Adam. 
a perfect creation of God was deceived, my friends. What about your wife? What about your husband today who's already fallen? Do you think they stand a chance? We don't. Yes, the devil is defeated from the cross, but he still is spoiling it for you and me. It's like that team that knows that they're not going to win the premiership. But because they are playing against a team that needs to win to retain the premiership or to be promoted, they will spoil it for the other team. That's what the devil is doing. He is spoiling it for you by messing up your marriage. So he divides them. The two are no longer one. No longer one in objective. Men and women are now separated because of sin that came in. And God asks, where are you? Have you eaten? God is asking questions today, my friends. Are you living with your correct husband? According to the law of God, is that woman you are staying with your wife? According to the kingdom principles? Or you are building on sand? Because when God does not build that marriage, those who build in it are building on sand. And I'm hoping in this presentation I'll help you out there to build on the foundations of God. Remember what I told you, when God created marriage, these are the things that he intended for your marriage. Firstly, he wants you to have dominion. Secondly, he created you in your, in his likeness, in his image. Yet the devil came and said, when you eat of this tree, you will be like God. What a deception, what a lie. They were already in the image of God, but Satan told them, when you eat this, you will be like God. Many times, my friends, people come in wanting to have sex with you. People, people flirt with you out there. Not because you're not getting it in your marriage. You are. But he says it is better out there. Grass is greener on the other side. But let me tell you this. Grass is always greener on the septic tanks. How about that? <laughs> Some of these places we go to satisfy our pleasures are not in God's plan. And that is why we have problems in our marriages. So God gave us a divine mandate. We were created in his likeness and we were given a charge in our marriages to procreate children after his likeness. Are all your children that you see into this world in a home, sir? Are there children, are there no children of yours out there that you went and geographically spaced? God asked questions and I'm asking you questions today. Where are your children? Woman, are all the children who are making noise in your home the total number? What about the other one you aborted? I'm just asking questions. What about the other one that lives with your grandmother that's your child? Because children are meant to be raised as a godly seed in a mother and a father environment that fears God. And therefore when sin came, what did it bring? It brought brokenness in marriage. It brought fallen stature, thinking that's corrupted. Sibling rivalry fighting in the family, insubordination, and finally divorce entered as a word. So when Lucifer was saying to Eve, eat of this fruit, it's, good, it's going to make you like God, he was giving them half-truths. He was not telling them the other bedside that would happen because of sin, which is always the case in our day, my friends. Have a girlfriend. Sex is sweeter outside marriage, but it doesn't tell you when there are babies outside there, it's going to break your home. It's going to cause your wife to be depressed. It's going to cause your children with that woman of yours who call your wife to be angry at you when they see other children coming in from the bush. So the devil doesn't tell you the full truth. He didn't tell them that when you eat, you shall see that you're naked and that the glory of God shall depart. He didn't tell them all of that. He gave them the half-truths of sweetness and we see fallenness coming in and one of the engines, the engines were destroyed. So we see that there is an enemy who rebelled against God. There's an arch enemy. The Bible calls him in Revelation chapter 12, the old serpent, Satan. 
the one who deceives all nations. Satan fought, according to Revelation chapter 12, to take over the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 puts it very clearly, my friend. Let's read again from the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. And let's see what was Satan's idea when he came to Adam and Eve. He did not expose this agenda, my friends, but he had a propaganda statement to woo them to fall. Number, verse number 12 says, how, are, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Verse 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. So we see. Lucifer having an agenda to want to disrupt the order of God and to install a different order. So when he came to Adam and Eve and gave them the half-truths and twisting the words of God, did God say you may not eat of all the trees of the garden? That was a false statement, my friend. God had said don't eat of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, but of all others you may eat. But the devil said, you shall not. Did God say you cannot eat of all these trees? Be careful. Satan comes with a very plausible argument. He will come to you, men of God, in very insidious but very cunning ways. And by the end of that conversation, Eve was beginning to see things differently. Let me tell you this, child of God. Never get into a conversation with the devil or the agent of the devil. When you perceive that this conversation is not godly, cut it immediately. Expose it immediately. If an elder or a pastor or a deacon or whoever, man of God, whom you know is married, comes to you and flirts with you, go tell the wife immediately. Expose that conversation because when you don't, it's going to fester and cause your perception to change. Because the Bible says, as Eve considered the fruit in the conversation, she ended up seeing the fruit as something to be desired, something that can make you wiser. In our trying to be wiser in our own eyes, we shall fall. And therefore, when Adam was deceived, I don't know what went through his mind, but I can almost maybe bring you to this perspective. What was happening in Adam's mind when he saw Eve holding the fruit that he knew was forbidden? What do you think went into Adam's mind? Because the Bible doesn't tell us. It just says, and she gave to his husband and he ate. And by the time God comes, Adam blames the wife. So when did Adam begin to blame the wife? I'm sure they must have had a conversation. Eve, is this not the fruit God said we must not eat? Eve, how could you? And I'm sure Eve must have used her charm. Come on, sweetheart, just a bite. Look, I have eaten and I have not died. Friends, don't toy around with sin. The consequences are dire. God allowed them to make their choices. God will allow you to make your choices, but he will not spare you from the consequences. He will come and judge. So when Adam and Eve obeyed Satan, this actually was the door that Adam and Eve opened to Satan. And they handed over their dominion and their capacity to be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the world. They gave it over to Satan. And that's why today, my friends, we see pain everywhere. Pain in every aspect of our life. Now we have to be employed to earn a living when Adam actually had the whole garden to himself. We now have the pain of raising money when everything was given for free to Adam and Eve to manage and have dominion over. We have to buy our fish now. We have to buy tickets to fly in the sky that God gave us dominion. Sin brought a lot of brokenness. Look at the pain 
that mothers go through just trying to be babies. I mean, to, to, to be mothers to babies. The largest reason or cause of mortality for women in Africa is childbirth, just trying to be a mother. Look at the pain that we go through and the disruption that has happened in our soils that they no longer give us food out of the ground. Look at the pain that we see in broken families and children who are growing up without parents. Friends, when Adam and Eve opened up that door by appetite, wanting to fulfill their desires, they brought a lot of brokenness. What desires, what emotions, what appetites are you feeding today that are bringing brokenness to your marriage? There are things you are doing today that are bringing brokenness in your marriage. And the whole host of heaven stood as they beheld the great controversy unfolding. And when Adam had eaten of the tree, there was a conversation in heaven. God said, seeing that man is now like us, knowing good and evil, what must we do? God sent an angel, chased them out of the Garden of Eden. And around the tree of life, there were two trees in that garden, one of knowledge of good and evil and another of, of, of life. God said, go and protect that life. They cannot take off the leaves of that tree, which they had always been eating. They must no longer take that because when they take that, it means they will live eternally as sinners. We could be having Adam and Eve right now today as old as I don't know how, if they had eaten of that tree of life. So God denied them access to the tree. It's now preserved for those who will accept Jesus, be saved through Jesus so that they can enter into the city and have access to that tree of life whose fruit is for the healing of nations. And so we lost dominion. We gave it over to Satan. In the book of Job, we see Satan coming into the presence of the angels of God representing planet earth in the time of Jesus in John chapter uh, is it chapter 12 or chapter 14 Jesus says I saw Satan fall from heaven the prince of this world was coming and Jesus said he has nothing in me we see the devil being cast out of heaven and the tree of life being protected there were things that God had to remove from the presence of Adam and Eve. One of it was physically, they had to be shifted from Eden to outside of Eden. And their communion with God shifted. They couldn't talk to God face to face. God had to kill a lamp to clothe them. God did not divorce them, but so much changed. So in other words, my friends, there is a host of heaven of angels from God and a host of angels from the dark kingdom that are fighting over your marriage, fighting for control. They are angels of God that support the divine plan of God that are at your disposal when you believe in Jesus. But there's also a legion of angels, demons that are present and are waiting to make sure you suffer and your marriage breaks and your legacy is destroyed. When your marriage is broken, my friends, it's not just a physical that's broken. Your legacy, your future, the posterity and your children are destroyed too. And so angels are very much involved in our lives, especially in our marriages. The good angels of God, they come in and they help us to strengthen us in the spirit and the strength and life of the kingdom of God. But demons seek to take away your life. And they give you a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of causing chaos in homes and destroying other homes. They change your personalities. They want you to fulfill your desires and all your weaknesses to be practiced. Whereas God seeks to destroy your weaknesses and give you the strength of his character. So when we give in to these different powers and spirits, it determines the outcome of our marriages. And when we hand over ourselves to practice wickedness and sin and corruption and immorality in our marriages, what are we doing? We are giving Satan the throne to rule and we lose the capacity to rule our homes, to manage our children, 
to steer our careers in the areas we are supposed to dominate as God determined. And much more is lost. And when we are not in the kingdom of God and practicing the kingdom of God, but we are listening to the other kingdom of darkness, decisions are made which are apart from God. And these notoriously wind up in causing more harm than good in our marriages. By destroying our marriages, what is Satan doing? He seeks to destroy our future families. He seeks to negatively impact our societies and our countries and the whole world. He came to the center of authority. That's why we must commit our marriages in prayer and cultivate a real relationship of humility while seeking God's wisdom and guidance and asking him for love, for grace, and for mercy in all things. John chapter 10 says, I think it's verse 10. It says the enemy, the thief, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. It is God's desire that your marriage live an abundant life. But it is also your enemy's desire to steal. To steal what? To steal your blessing. To, to, to kill. To kill what? Your faith, your joy, and your salvation. To destroy. To destroy what? Your future to destroy your children, to destroy your posterity, to destroy your name, to destroy your reputation, to destroy everything you own. But Jesus came that you may have life. So today, my friends, I'm praying that you may give over your marriage to Jesus, that you may pray for his angels to encompass you and that you may live a life that's full of grace and mercy. Friends, I want you to know that we are in a battle. The marriage relationship finds itself at the center of the battle between good and evil. You have to build your marriage intentionally and deliberately choosing to build it according to the purpose of God. When you don't, my friend, you are giving room to the devil. And Satan wants to destroy your marriage because he knows when he does that, he also destroys your legacy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 18 puts it very bluntly that those who believe in God must acknowledge that you are only strong when you are in the Lord. That's verse 10. And in the power of his might, outside of his strength, his power, we are weak, my friends. Therefore, verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know that you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness that sits in high places. Therefore, verse 13 says, you take upon you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, you stand with your loins get about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, you take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the darts of the fiery uh, wicked one. Verse 17, and you take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, with which, which is the word of God. Verse 18, you pray always with all power and with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching with all perseverance and supplication for your marriage and all saints deliberately changed the praying, fasting with supplication in the spirit for your marriage and for all saints. So friends, what am I saying in this short presentation before I finish it? The whole universe is divided into two rival kingdoms. There's no middle line. It's either you are in the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness, and it's either you are seeking for it, 
Matthew 6 verse 33, you are seeking for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and you are seeking for all the blessings that God proclaimed for marriage to be yours. Childbearing, raising up children to be citizens of the universe, being happy, being at peace, being joyful, being fulfilled. You are seeking for all of that. It's either you are in that kingdom or you are, in, you are ruled by the kingdom of darkness. You are commanded by Satan and everything you do destroys peace in the home. Everything you do causes tears in other marriages. Everything that you do causes disruption and pain and sorrow. Don't be the reason why someone cries in their marriage. Don't be the reason why someone is sad and, and hates God because of your actions in marriage. And Satan, therefore, my friends, is our enemy. He is our only enemy who comes to kill, to destroy, and to steal. And that our world is the battleground where all his efforts are seen competing with God and trying to win people and disrupt them and remove them from God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that we read says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, my friends. Your wife, your husband is not the enemy. It's what is inside him. Don't be afraid of him. Be afraid of the ones who are behind him or who's behind him. The legions of evils that are seen speaking and acting out of anger and abuse, whether verbal or physical. We fight against rulers, against powers in this world, forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, my friend. And that's why Calvary stands as God's definitive blow that sealed the fate of the devil. Jesus, when he was speaking to his disciples, says, I will send you out two by two to preach the kingdom. Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10. He then sent the 70. That's Luke chapter 10. When they went out and they were given power and authorities over demons and over snakes and scorpions. Very interesting allegory. Snakes and scorpions. He says, they went, they came back rejoicing because they said demons are subject to us. Let me tell you this, my friends. When God created you and redeemed you in Christ, he restored dominion to you. He gave you power. You can master your temptations and all the trials you have gone through. Don't tell me, Melus, you don't understand what I'm going through. I will never ever forgive for this and for that. No, my friends. God has given you power to defeat Anything the devil throws into your marriage, including infidelity. Because when God saw Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he didn't even divorce them, my friends. Can I repeat that? God did not divorce them when they fought in the front of God. And Adam accused Eve of being the reason. And Eve even said, I am a Satanist because I listened to the snake. God, in his love, in his grace, he never divorced them. But he killed a lamp. And covered both of them. You both need the grace of God. Don't tell me she sinned against me or he sinned against me. No, you are both sinners before God. In fact, in, in the part three, I'm going to show you how by practicing humility and meekness, you will not even look at the speck in your wife's eye, but you look at the log in your own eye. When you see your partner falling, it must remind you of how fallen you are. And therefore, you must exercise Kingdom principles that restore those who are fallen and Calvary stands is the place where Christ said, enough, enough. When the, king, when, the prince, when the disciples came back rejoicing that demons are now hearing us and they are fleeing, Jesus says, don't rejoice over that, but rejoice that your names are written in the kingdom records. There's a process you need to go through to make sure you don't just participate in the kingdom of God here on earth by being an evangelist for God, but you must also make sure your name is written in heaven. There's a, there's a writing of names and there's a deleting of names that's happening even as we practice our marriages. There are some marriages God is condemning. There are some God is writing in the book of life. Where is yours written, my friends? Because there is an enemy who is here to destroy, 
But Christ came and he fought him, lived a holy life, sent his disciples, they conquered him. And when Jesus saw that happening, he remarked and said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a star or like lightning. And Jesus in John chapter 14 began to say to his disciples, from henceforth, the prince of this world cometh, but he is nothing in me. Henceforth, I'm not going to talk much about you because Jesus was now turning his attention from his disciples to confront the arch enemy of your marriage. And the Bible says he went in. He could have said no. He could have stood on the legal grounds and say, on legality, on legality, I'm deciding not to die. Because his arrest was, according to those who analyze in the legal framework, it was, it, it was actually a breaking of the law. It was unconstitutional the way he was arrested, the way he was tried. He could have actually stood and said, I need a lawyer to set me free because you, what you're doing to me is unfair, it's, it's unjust. But he took the injustice. He humbled himself. That's what Paul says. I'll talk to this in the next episode. Women, when you humble yourself, you're not losing much, but you're gaining a lot. And you're gaining many others. And when Christ humbled himself and allowed to be treated unjustly, allowed them to accuse him, allowed one of his, the closest, to betray him. When even Peter could not confess him, he prayed for Peter that he may repent. And when, we, when they killed him and he died, he submitted his spirit to God. How do you fight the battles that you face in your marriage? Because we live in this world that's broken by the evil one is festered by sin. We are born sinners. We are seen in us. The first inclination of that child is to scream and to cry and to cause a mess. From the moment we are born, but Jesus died, that he may take back the keys of life, that he may restore to you power. Let me read for you as I close. What actually happened on the cross? Come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Let me, let me show you what actually happened at the cross and what was restored when Jesus died for us. Revelation chapter 12. We're finishing this, my friends. There is a controversy over your, your marriage. Don't deal with it from a human perspective. Always see things from God's perspective. The brokenness of Adam and Eve was not reason for him to divorce them. The brokenness and the sin that came into the marriage elicited God to give even a bigger blessing, to give a bigger gift to mankind. He gave us Jesus. When there is more brokenness, when sin abounded, God added even more love. We play into the enemy's camp when we refuse to practice kingdom principles in our marriages, especially in times and moments when there's sin and there's brokenness in our marriages, in our children, and disobedience and rebellion in our children, we should exercise kingdom principles. They need more of our love when there is sin than when things are good. I hope someone can tweet that. Chapter 12, listen to what happened. Verse 10, and I heard a voice saying in heaven, now salvation and now strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them day and night before God, has been cast down. Let me tell you, my friends, at Calvary, three things were given to us. Salvation was secured. When you build your marriage under the banner of the cross of Christ, there is salvation of souls, not destruction. There is salvation. The evil one is vanquished. His power is vanquished. In fact, I like it on verse 11. It says, and they overcame him. There's victory. There's victory. When we built our marriages under Christ and we banish the evil one in our marriages and we rebuke him by prayer and by practicing the principles of the spirit of God, of love, of meekness 
and humility, we vanquish Satan. It says there's salvation that is granted. There's strength, my friends. We are powerful when we are in Christ. We are unstoppable. You and God in your marriage. You are a company unlimited. There is dominion right there. There is power right there. You can do almost anything. You are the only institution God created. And the only institution God gave the Sabbath. The only institution that was given power to create other human beings. Friends, your marriage is God's window and door into his kingdom or into hell. How are you building your marriages today now that you know there's an enemy who fights against you? It says, salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Jesus died on the cross to restore us into the kingdom of God. And he died so that he can give us power. Do you see him in Matthew chapter 28 saying, All power in heaven on earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. Friends, build your family on the cross of Jesus. That is the kingdom of God's place to restore what the enemy stole away from us. Now we are saved. Now we have strength. Now we have the kingdom of God. Now we have the power of Christ. And therefore, verse 11, we shall overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we will never love our lives even unto death because we know even in death, we are more than victors. God will raise us up on the last day. What am I saying, my friends? Don't live your life. Don't get married being ignorant of the fact that you're playing into the enchanted ground of the devil. I want you to be aware that Christ wants you to dedicate your marriage, dedicate yourself, dedicate your children to him so that they can grow his kingdom. What am I saying today, my friends, as I conclude this talk? I want to tell you, you as a couple, where you are today, let me finish this and wrap this up. I've made my point. You are living in Satan's enchanted ground. And therefore, God has unleashed his dominion again upon you in Jesus Christ. God has unleashed the capacity for you to be fruitful and to multiply with your God-given husband. Not the one of your adultery. That you need to kiss away. Cut them off. Find your God-given husband. God is saying, Satan has rebelled against God. And he has challenged the government of God over your life. And he comes to you to cause you to break the word of God. God meant it, my friends. When he said, thou shalt not commit adultery, he was trying to protect us from the tens and the hundreds of sexually transmitted diseases. HIV and AIDS was controlled and was prevented when God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Five words. God gave us the principles. God gave us the word that's meant to protect us as a hedge around us. And Satan can do nothing unless God allows him. Because the word protects and builds our solid foundations. But Satan wants you to disobey this law. And when you disobey it, my friend, the consequences are upon you. Thirdly, I want you to know that Satan came. He tempted mankind. Not only did he tempt him, but when mankind heeded the temptations of Satan, men handed over dominion and rulership of this world to Satan. He is now the prince of this world. But Jesus appeared that he may break and destroy the works of Satan. Even in your marriage, God seeks that there be dominion, there be power restored, which is, which is what the devil stole away from us. But in Christ, we are restored. In Christ, we are a stronger marriage. In Christ, we are given the capacity to dominate and to overcome. Jesus came to defeat Satan.
and to save our marriages, to save our families, and ultimately to serve humanity and restore power and the kingdom in our lives. In our day, the verse said in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, today, when you hear this word, today, when you heed this message that says, you are not alone, my friends, you are living on enchanted ground. Today, when you hear the word of the Lord, you too can be delivered from the powers of hell. God has given us power, salvation, and the kingdom and strength in Christ Jesus. We overcome not by our own might, but we overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. God is now calling you and your wife. God is calling you and your children. God is calling all of us today to restore his image in our families, in our marriages. Friends, I know you're going through a hard time. I know there are days some of you may have thought, should I really be married to this woman? There are days you regret the day you were married to this woman. I remember reading somewhere in one of the books that says a man was saying, we were happy with my wife for 20 years until the day we got married. And many of our young people today no longer want to get married because they have seen examples that they don't like. They have seen the brokenness that happens in marriages and they don't want to have anything to do with it. But today, I'm calling you, my friends. The enemy is waiting for you out there. You are happier. You are more at peace when you heed the word of God. I'm calling you today to submit your marriage, to submit yourself to Christ. Bow down with me as we pray today, as we seek the blessing of God over our marriages. Father in heaven, I thank you. I bless your name because you have made it possible for us who were cursed under the curse of wickedness and sin and rebellion to be reinstated, to be reinstalled, to be restored to your kingdom and to once again proclaim salvation and strength and the kingdom of God of our marriages, to proclaim strength and power to overcome all manner of wickedness the devil throws at us. I thank you, Father, for the armor of salvation that you are giving to us, that when we study your word, when we put on our faith in you, regardless of what we suffer, regardless of what the devil throws at us, regardless of the pain and the brokenness we see, in Christ Jesus, we overcome by his blood. Help us to stand and to testify that there is power, there is victory, there is conquering in the name of Jesus. Help us to proclaim today, Lord, that there is joy, there is peace, there is happiness in our marriages because we surrendered all to Christ. We thank you, Father, for the privilege to know that in you, through Jesus Christ who died on the cross, we are redeemed, we are saved, and we have hope to restore your kingdom, your power, and your glory, even in our marriages. Help us in our brokenness. Help us where we have faltered and have failed, that we may restore, that we may forgive, that we may seek to rebuild, that we may Walk in the ways of the Spirit as He guides us into all truth and life. Bless us, Lord, and bless those who've been listening to this presentation. I pray that you may restore in them your kingdom, your salvation, your power, and the spirit of truth that will lead them into all love, into all joy, into all meekness, into all humility and peace, and above all, to dwell in the presence of God happily thereafter. For this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Friends, I want to invite you to join me on the third episode of this mini-series. We'll be talking about 15 ways to restore and to make sure your marriage functions according to God's purpose for your marriage. God bless you. See you on the next episode. Amen.